So thank you all so much for joining us for our next in the series of our monthly OCD Massachusetts lecture series. So this series takes place the first Tuesday of every month at seven o'clock, and it is followed by a local support group uh, that's run via Zoom, and I'll put that information into the chat uh, towards the end of the presentation today. And so for today, we're honored to have Dr. Oscar Morales with us. So Dr. Morales is the medical director of the TMS service here at McLean Hospital. Uh, is also the associate director of psychiatry and neurotherapeutics program. And really, it's, it's a pleasure to have you with us here today, Oscar. You know, for those of you who haven't had the chance to, to meet Oscar or interact with him and see some of his work, uh, Dr. Morales was actually part of the first team in 2008 that led to the FDA approval for TMS, uh, specifically in the treatment for depression. In addition, he was the primary investigator and lead for the worldwide trial that resulted in um, the, res the FDA approval for deep TMS in 2013. And so over the, the years, Dr. Morales has been really increasing the presence of neurotherapeutics and TMS here at McLean, working with units across the hospital, including the OCDI, and working with individuals for TMS for depression and OCD, and has really been a leader in the field. So it's an, it's an honor to have you with us today. And thank you so much for joining. Thank you. So before we get started, just to let everyone know that we, um, we will be recording today, and so we will continue to post these to our OC Massachusetts YouTube channel. And so if you haven't checked that out, definitely check us out on YouTube. Also, any updates that we have around the presentations, around information or resources, will be posted to our website, ocmassachusetts.org. And you can also find us on LinkedIn. Um, well, actually not on LinkedIn, I'm sorry. On Instagram, Twitter, uh, and Facebook, um, all the ones that we're supposed to have minus one. We'll get working on that next one. But thank you all for joining us. And as you have questions, or please feel free to put it in the chat or in the Q&A. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have a little bit of a discussion with Dr. Morales and we can ask questions that, that the audience might have and have a little bit of discussion um, to build on the presentation this evening. So with that, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Dr. Morales. Thank you very much for inviting, uh, inviting us. I I am part of a group, and uh, today I will have the opportunity to discuss with you TMS for OCD, for the treatments of OCD. And uh, I would like to start by showing you what should be the content. And the idea is to have with you a general conversation about TMS as a clinical treatment, a clinical tool. And we will be discussing a little bit of uh, what TMS is, how it works. And I also would like to share with you some of the specific information, data about TMS for the treatment of OCD. And uh, at the end, I will tell you about TMS role, in my opinion, the role that TMS should play in clinical management of OCD. Uh, we'll discuss a little bit side effects tolerance, uh, ERP, medications, DBS, and surgery. So probably the most important aspect of this conversation is to have a chance to discuss with you and to address questions and specific uh, concerns or uh, clarifications that needed to be done. So we'll try to do this presentation as short as possible. Uh, and with the idea of in mind of having plenty of a conversation with all of you. First, let me show you a slide which shows you what has been happening in the academic world regarding TMS. This is particular slides tells you the number of publication output per year until 2015-16. Since 2015 and 16, you can imagine the amount of information is, has grown ex exponentially. Despite of the fact that this slide is already impressive, you will see, you will be, I think, pleasantly surprised that there, there's a lot more already. First, um, let me start by telling you that and I'm, I know that this audience is familiar with the TMS some more, some less, but in general, there is already some good background about the use of TMS. 
and I would like to address a few basic concepts. TMS is non-invasive. It's a way, it's a method, it's a methodology developed for brain stimulation and uh, magnetic fields are delivered to the brain. The, the idea of delivering magnetic fields to the brain is excitation, stimulation, or depolarization of the neurons in the, in the cerebral cortex. So the device, all devices, all TM, TMS really is a very vague general term. TMS devices uses a rapidly changing magnetic field to induce a, an electrical current inside of the brain. And uh, by inducing this electromagnetic induction, neurons are depolarized. In general, I have to tell you that uh, um, deep TMS in particular may reach no more than five centimeters and other coils that are part of the TMS device or devices may reach a lot less, perhaps 1.5 centimeters for some 0.5 centimeters. So there's a wide range of variation in the level of penetration. So the coils, as I was explaining, is only a part, is it of, it's only a component of a, a TMS device, uh, but the device itself, the system itself, has the capability of generating 1.5 to 2 Tesla. And this is what is possible to deliver for cortical neuron activation. And that happened beneath the, the coil. So it's very focal and uh, the level of penetration again is going to depend on the technology that is being used. Most of the conventional equipments penetrate not deeper than the cortex. That means that most of the conventional equipments will not penetrate beyond 0.5 centimeters. However, research has shown that it was enough to stimulate a substantial number of neurons, millions, we are talking about millions of neurons, and that uh, in clinical care translated into recovery of some syndromes, initially specifically was for depression. What is probably more interesting and exciting is that it's not only, uh, the device is not only able to depolarize neurons beneath the coil, but also is going to activate networks, circuits, in the same hemisphere and far away in the other hemisphere. All this has been tested using different, different methodologies such as PET, imaging, EEG. So in other words, the basics of TMS is not complicated, it's relatively simple. It's a way to depolarize neurons in the, in the, in the, in the brain, especially in the cortex. And um, neurons communicate with each other and then multiple neur neurons activated the will. Um, the concept that how neurons work at this point involves networks, complex networks of uh, uh, neurons and the ability to activate or depolarize one of these networks from the cortex of the brain uh, is probably one of the major breakthroughs in neuroscience. And I will explain a little bit more why that happened and, and what is the expectation for the near future. So let me say that the poles, the magnetic poles induces again an electrical current. The electrical current depolarized neurons and that will trigger action potentials that will finally end up in, re in the release of chemicals of neurotransmitters. So the polarization of neurons can happen, but it depends on where the coil is placed. So if we want to depolarize the frontal lobes, so we know that circuits connected to the frontal areas will be depolarized. And again, remember that uh, circuits and complex networks will be activated deeper and in some cases far away in the uh, contra and the other hemisphere 
um, these effects have been associated with recovery from symptoms. Uh, initially, and this was tested for symptoms of depression in psychiatry, but previously had been tested for um, other, um, other conditions. Initially, it was uh, primarily in neurological conditions. Um, the activation of deeper neurons is going to have an impact in portions of targeted circuits. And it depends on what kind of circuits we attempt to activate. So the uh, activation will translate into recovery from uh, symptoms related to depression in the case of depression or OCD, uh, in the case of uh, obsessive compulsive disorders. And more recently, as you will see later, this also has been tested for uh, smoking cessation. So among other neurological effects that have been uh, found to be uh, identified, we can uh, talk a little uh, or mention neuronal excitation that we call facilitation. But uh, the technology allows for an induction of inhibition, neuronal inhibition, and then um, so both can be combined too. So stimulation in one site may potentially inhibit a site far away and through interhemispheric uh, communications. And there is also another important aspect of the stimulation. Uh, it may last longer beyond the time of the actual stimulation. Therefore, long-term post-stimulation effect is what was found important and uh, critical for purposes of uh, treatment of psychiatric conditions. So other neurobiological effects that can be mentioned is uh, neuroplasticity. So the capacity of the brain to change is, is being known and we call it plasticity. So this brain ability to reorganize itself, forming new connections, new circuits happens normally, uh, especially when the brain has suffered some injuries. So it allows neurons in the brain to compensate for, for uh, injuries or disease and uh, gradually this knowledge is being used in TMS for excitation of appropriate area that were affected by something, for instance, uh, head trauma, or we can also mention stroke. But the fact of the matter is that neuroplasticity is, uh, it happens. So the brain reorganization takes place by different mechanisms. And one of them is called ac axonal sprouting. Axonal sprouting is no more that uh, the development of more uh, um, connections in which undamaged axons grow and the new nerve endings reconnect. And all of this has been in some way linked to injured or, or, or some kind of brain damage. So non-damaged or undamaged axons can also sprout. So nerve endings can grow and connect with other undamaged nerve cells, forming new neural pathways. What that means is that the brain can change and sometimes many things that we do in medicine stimulates that. Many times that axonal sprouting is something we don't want, might be detrimental. In some other time that can be used. And as you can imagine, we don't have full control about it. A anyhow, in order to reconnect, neurons need to be stimulated through some uh, way or through some kind of activity. And this is where TMS plays a critical role in neuroscience, because now we have this ability to induce some stimulation that is focal and potentially may induce some neuroplasticity. It has been investigated, um, probably in, 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 in um, stroke has been subjected to a lot of intensive research using this uh, thinking, this uh, 
uh, ideas and, and uh, attempting to induce a new neural pathways and development, uh, attempting to correct some dysfunction that might have occurred. So there is some idea that the compensatory masquerade uh, allows uh, the, the construction of pathways in, in neighborhood or in healthy areas. If something happens in an area, it's possible that the brain will uh, reorganize in the, uh, the, the challenge is can we help the brain to do it uh, in, in the way that we think might speed up a process of recovery. So here you have a device. There are, again, remember, there are many devices. In fact, the FDA has approved probably at this point more than five devices. So we have plenty of uh, devices in the market. This is one of them. But uh, all of them, the basics of all of them are exactly the same. All of them are using uh, magnetic field technology for purposes of brain stimulation. And one of the important aspects of the, all the components is the coil. And we'll discuss this a little bit more in the next uh, slides. This is only why, remember, there's no such a thing like the coil for, for use in TMS. This is one of them, and we call this particular coil deep TMS because of the level of penetration in comparison to the majority of, or of the uh, traditional coils and systems available. So if we use a magnetic field for purposes of a stimulation, uh, how is that similar or different in comparison to ECT? And I have to tell you that it is markedly different. So it's, in some way, we are discussing about something that is very, very different. Um, in, the case, in the case of ECT, we have to deliver an electrical current externally. In the case of TMS, we deliver a magnetic field that translates internally into an electrical current. Is very small, uh, is focal, uh, non invading, is, is done in a non invasive way and penetrates through the skull in a, in a human being that is fully awake, fully alert, painless. Uh, when, uh, let me see this, when electricity passes through the skull, the current must, must go through two centimeters thickness of the skull. And the skull is a powerful insulator. It will keep electricity from reaching the brain. And that is one of the technological challenges regarding ECT and treatments. But that's not an issue for purposes of TMS because TMS, the magnetic field penetrates in a way that things matter is invisible. When we deliver a magnetic field, the skull is like if it were not there, so it doesn't matter that there is two centimeters thickness of or, or insulator there for electricity, the magnetic coil uh, field will penetrate uh, in a non-impeded way. So there are different ways of using this particular repet uh, um, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's considered to be unique because there is a rapid pulsation that causes electricity inside and within neurons. And the magnetic field uh, um, is going to activate, remember, neurons depending on the region over which the coil is physically placed. In other words, we basically, we can stimulate anything in the cortex of the, of the brain. So here you have a, you can see this is a simple way to show that you can do one or the other. You can excite neurons or you can inhibit neurons. We physicians excite neurons or inhibit neurons, neurons every single day. So we, there are many medications that, and that have, the, that the purpose of using some, medica some medications is excitation of neurons. Probably one of the most common examples in this scenario would be stimulants. But we can use do the opposite. We can inhibit neurons with TMS. And one common medication that is used for purposes of inhibition is uh, benzodiazepines. 
So in other words, the coil in a focal way can induce activation or induce inhibition. And it's, it's not really something strange because we use it, but the difference between medications and this is that you will do it in a very focal way. Medication will affect very large areas of both hemispheres. So other effects of TMS that are exciting and, and actively being investigated is uh, neurotrophic factors. So these will, there are substances that will induce neuron cell growth. Uh, neurotransmitters of different, uh, at, at different levels and receptors also will be, uh, has been studied and show that it's possible to induce some change in receptors and levels of uh, uh, neurotransmitters. So this slide uh, shows you the importance of stimulating relevant brain structures. What do I mean by that? What is a relevant brain structure? Well, a relevant brain structure is that structure that the clinician or the investigator attempts to excite. Sometimes that structure is very small, some other times is bigger. So the smaller, the more difficult to be precise, the bigger, of course, so the easier to the, for a stimulation and, the, and then the reliability and, repet, and that we can actually stimulate the same area multiple times, it's there. So that is where technology start playing a significant role in brain stimulation because you can use one or the other for one purpose or the other. We can stimulate very small areas or larger uh, portions of the cortex. There are clinical reasons for stimulation, not only in small or bigger areas, but the ability to stimulate deeper areas is becoming very clear and has been all the time a challenge. Neurosurgeons reach deeper areas and devices that are inserted in the, in the brain reach deep areas, almost any area that the neurosurgeon would like to implant a device, they could do it. With uh, magnetic TMS, you have that technological ability of, of excitation of the cortex. And eventually, if we succeed, circuits and in, in networks in deeper areas will be excited. The next question is, can we actually stimulate deeper? If we directly could stimulate deeper areas that also could give neuroscientists and clinicians and investigators a great opportunity to uh, challenge, uh, to use the methodologies and, and to target areas that potentially will translate into recovery of some neuropsychiatric conditions. And here you will see, uh, I wanted to show you some differences in some coils penetrate 0 .7, 0 0.7 centimeters. Other coils have been uh, tested and are expected to penetrate probably twice that much. And uh, that, that technological advances are gradually allowing us to penetrate more and more, and that will probably translate into better ability to help patients. If we think in terms of volume, it's not the same when we stimulate three centimeters volume, uh, three centi cubic centimeters volume versus 17 centimeters uh, cubic centimeters. So it's a huge amount of difference in the, the number of neuro, neurons that are stimulated. So we're talking now about millions of more neurons. Some points about safety. So basically TMS can be done without, without systemic side effects. So it's, non, it's, it's not chemical. And the only area that is affected is that small area in the cortex of the brain. There's no adverse effects on cognition, which means 
memory ability to concentrate, uh, ability to make decision is not negatively affected. The most common uh, uh, adverse effect, event or uh, side effect associated with TMS has been described as scalp pain or discomfort. Uh, and I have to tell you, the patient that we treat, probably close to 90% of them tolerate the treatment quite well with minimal discomfort. Uh, no seizure has been reported in, in, um, in many clinical trials. However, the, the potential for seizures are there because we are stimulating the cortex of the brain and any stimulation, if it is uh, uh, strong enough, potentially may trigger some seizure that can be very focal or can be more diffuse. Fortunately, is very the, the 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 risk is very low. It's probably lower than the risk of seizures induced with antidepressant medications, and that is a lot to say, because we know that we prescribe probably millions of uh, prescriptions uh, with antidepressant medications, but the rate of seizures is there for for the medications. In the case of TMS, the seizure uh, risk is lower in comparison to them. Uh, slide, this is only for historical purposes. 2003, a picture taken when uh, MIT was uh, uh, interested in all these development that have been happening in different areas of the country. And you can see this is a laboratory and a small coil, but uh, that, that, uh, this is the way how it, it started. So one idea that I would like to leave with you is that when we affect the cortex of the brain, the expectation is that we will, be ha we will have the ability of induce some kind of activation or inhibition in multiple areas and uh, surface and subcortical and deeper in, in, uh, structures in the brain may potentially be affected. There's only one full contraindication of TMS, and that would be the presence of metal, ferromagnetic or conductive materials in the skull. Other conditions are something that is we can deal with. It's possible to deliver a treatment safely, but uh, in general, uh, if there, there is some, uh, um, some for it, metal of any nature is a contraindication and there are people that have devices inserted in the brain, in the face, and that maybe uh, might keep us from using TMS or will have to be done in a very um, more special way for them. And there are cases that are on label as not, uh, not indicated uh, but it's and they are conditions that we can deal with. For instance, pregnancy, stroke, and epilepsy. Some of our patients uh, suffering from epilepsy and get treated uh, because of depression and OCD. And uh, there are ways to deal with those conditions in a safe and more controlled way. Some general numbers, and I don't want you to be overwhelmed with these numbers, but uh, OCD epidemiology in the United States is incredibly concerning. So the lifetime prevalence is 2.3%. 70% uh, have lifetime history of anxiety. 63% have a history of mood disorders. 23 to 32% have uh, personality disorders. 29% have lifetime history of tics. 12% will have schizophrenia. So you see this condition that we call OCD is, more, is very complex. And it's not only that, patients suffer from something else. And unless we target those conditions, uh, it's going to be difficult. And it, it is. Clinicians dealing with OCD are aware of how complicated it is when we treat OCD in the presence of other conditions. So, in the United States, it's considered that uh, probably there are at least uh, 410,000 
treatment resistant uh, see, uh, treatment resistance seeking for treatment. So medication that came that had been used on daily basis for OCD include, as you uh, many of you know, and you actually use them, fluoxetine, paroxetine, sertraline, fluvoxamine, and clomipramine. And now we should add as a treatment tool. Uh, Deep TMS that was approved by FDA in 2018, and they, the uh, superficial coil uh, for OCD that was approved in 2020. So now we have more tools. Um, the majority of the treatment modalities result in 30% improvement for 40 to 60% of OCD patients. And I would like to stress this fact because many patients and families ask me, is this going to be something that will give us at least 80% chances of recovery, 50% chances of recovery? And we have to tell them that um, it's, uh, you will see more uh, that and the number for TMS is a little bit different, but in general, medications will give 30% 30, 30 improvement for 40 to 60% of OCD patients. Uh, exposure and ERP is probably first line for uh, treatment for OCD. And uh, I cannot imagine someone being treated with medications or with any other intervention without being treated with ERP. So it's strongly recommended. I was asked to, to say something about uh, this, uh, ketamine. Apparently, there has been some interest, some research and some publications, and some people are uh, suggesting the possibilities of using ketamine for the use for the treatment of OCD. So I wanted to uh, show you this that uh, was published basically in the past few weeks. Uh, is basically saying that ketamine induces changes and delay alterations of OCD-like behaviors. This is in animals, animals. Uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's incredibly uh, exciting because if this information keeps uh, de in, in development, this will, in the future, will have to involve clinical trials, sham control, randomized controlled trials that will give us a good sense of where we should go with other medications such as this. Uh, a few more words about treatment resistant OCD. So 1% of the, of the population has no improvement. Doesn't matter what we use. And 1% that benefits from treatments are actually still affected by, all, by OCD symptoms. Schizophrenia affects, and this is for purposes of comparison. Schizophrenia affects 1% of the population. And that, there are about 20 approved antipsychotic medications. So we have very few medications approved for the treatment of OCD. Uh, and that is a problem. And having something like TMS really is changing this, the treatment uh, options scenario. Uh, one single word about also, uh, circuits. So in the case of OCD, what exactly happened and why people develop OCD symptoms, we don't know. Sometimes there are stronger uh, propositions uh, or weaker or idea that have not been tested at all. But the bottom line is, is still unclear what is the thing that is causing the OCD. For some patients, maybe genes. For also other patients, it would be something that has been affected the genes eventually and at some point in life. And then, uh, but uh, what we know is that circuits have been affected and most of the OCD circuits really involve cortical, so cortical and deeper structures. Uh, a few slides about, uh, this was a preliminary trial that show how TMS could have been helpful or could be helpful. The red line that you see here is a high frequency TMS that shows a huge different or significant clinical uh, statistically difference, significant difference in comparison to sham that is the blue line. 
And here you see different frequencies. Uh, low frequency was shown not to be helpful, but high frequency was. The, the, the one of the traditional or the, the, the most important trial was conducted in, using a standard, traditional, randomized sham control uh, um, criteria. So it was a high frequency stimulation and you can see that um, patients were followed at uh, different points, uh, week three, week six, and the uh, response rate for uh, real treatment was 38%. And I would like to remind you that response means at least 50% reduction in symptoms. That would, was 38%. And partial response, that was something that was obviously less than 50%, was relatively high, but could have been a small re percentage reduction in symptoms in those patients. So there are basically three TMS approval uh, uh, conditions that FDA have approved. One is depression. Number two is obsessive compulsive disorder. And more recently, and we are talking about the past few months, uh, FDA approved smoking cessation. Deep TMS coil was approved for the smoking cessation. So now we can use TMS for depression, OCD, and smoking cessation. Conclusion. is a technique that induces electrical currents in the neurons by using strong focal magnetic fields. It is different from ECT because ECT delivers electricity and the TMS delivers magnetic fields. The induced current brings multiple physiological changes, uh, neuron activations, long-term changes, and circuits and complex networks can be affected, uh, stimulated, or inhibited. So currently there are many diagnostic and, and therapeutic applications or research applications of TMS. And we, there, there's a lot of expectations uh, that uh, new approvals are coming. So we expect that new applications will be approved in the near future. We were just recently part of a TMS for uh, PTSD that unfortunately unfortunately didn't show responses, but expect other conditions that will be treated with TMS soon. Um, that is basically what I wanted to share with you before getting to some questions and perhaps comments. Uh, and I would like to show the mm, team that we have. It's a, a very comprehensive team and, and it's, it's not a one person. I, I'm, I'm really, um, uh, honor to be leading the Air Force, but don't think that it is uh, uh, Oscar Morales that has been doing everything. We have a very powerful uh, clinical and research team, and uh, I appreciate all the efforts that they have been doing in order to achieve concrete results that really offer patients something that was not available in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oscar. Wonderful presentation. And thank you for all the information on how TMS works and really a kind of a, a hopeful presentation on how well it does work and kind of all the potential uses for it. Uh, I see we have a couple questions from, from the audience. I think one, uh, you, one you already talked about a little bit, which was the difference between TMS and ECT specifically for OCD. Um, would you, could you talk a little bit more in terms of why ECT hasn't really kind of shown an effect for OC OCD as a frontline treatment where TMS has? Uh, I think that uh, in the first place, there are very few studies using ECT for the treatment of OCD. Doesn't matter how many people may potentially use it. There are very few studies published studies. That is one of the major problems. So with no one knows if it really works or not. In the studies, the few published studies have shown that it, is, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So using ECT for OCD, in my opinion, is, is, uh, um, is not appropriate. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it, but I understand that sometimes people or 
colleagues might use it not exactly because they are treating OCD, but because they are treating the coexistent comorbidities around OCD, which are very common and complicated. So anything that can potentially help the patient, we would like to use. But uh, again, uh, is not up, is not been tested. There are no sham control studies using ECT for for the treatment of OCD. Great, thank you. I, I think that's an important point with the comorbid um, kind of disorders and comorbid depression. Sometimes the recommendations may be different depending on what other things that someone someone is facing. Um, one of the other questions that we have is: Does TMS affect the brain the same way as benzodiazepines? Definitely yes and no. Yes, because TMS can in, uh, there is the, ex, the you know, we can induce inhibition. Benzodiazepines induce inhibition. So from that point of view, yes, both may end up um, affecting the brain in, in similar ways. Where the major difference comes is TMS is going to affect a very focal area. Mm -hmm. Probably no more than, if we use a coil that affects a lot, big portions of the brain, it's not going to be more than four centimeters square area. That would be a lot. Uh, and then it can be as small as 0.5 centimeters square area. So it's, uh, it's a small. Uh, when we use benzodiazepines or any other medication, we are really loading healthy and unhealthy areas in the brain. You see, unfortunately, there's no other way to do it. But here we can. And the, the challenge for the TMS field is how can we use this successfully, effectively? And that's, that is one of the problems. We are still not there yet, but we know that we can induce inhibition. Hopefully in the future, we will use it for clinical treatments, but it's in research. Excellent. And so it, essentially it's a very focal, a focal approach and kind of a little bit more tailored to what it yes. is, to the circuits that are, that are affected with OCD. And then maybe I should add uh, uh, Nathaniel that uh, in medicine, there is one basic concept. So the concept is we should do, we shouldn't harm first. And secondly, we should use always less invasive modalities. So if you go to your cardiologist, he's not going to start with a you know, surgical intervention to your heart. He's going to start with something that is a very low level of invasiveness. Right. So it doesn't make sense in psychiatry to start with something that is very invasive. We must and, uh, challenge any concept that we should start with the most invasive modality because it's still there, I have to tell you, but uh, it's changing, it's changing. And I believe that nothing better for a change that patients and families, when they see it, it's, uh, it's a lot easier. Excellent, I think that's a great point. But one of the other questions that's come up from uh, the audience was, do, would mass health insurance cover TMS treatment? And are there certain, uh, I'm combining two here, but there also are there certain insurance prerequisites or requirements for TMS for OCD, such as having to try medications or behavioral treatment or otherwise first? Well, I have good news and bad news. The bad news is that zero companies have a policy covering for TMS treatment of OCD. No one covers, no one has a policy covering TMS for the treatment of OCD yet. The good news is that 50% of maybe more of our patients are treated as covered by insurance companies. So what is happening? What is happening is that the insurance companies are responding well. So we are delighted. From the very beginning, they started responding and uh, I think they trust the field that uh, it's time to change. And despite of the fact that their own organizations have not approved the policy for cover, they see the necessity. Mm -hmm. And I believe yeah. that organizations like yours are playing a vital role because they know that these organizations are already recommending treatment that are available. 
it sounds like we have our work cut out for us to, to change that fact, but it's it's good to hear that, you know, the idea that 50% or more of individuals go through TMS are successful in getting reimbursement. I think that's a really huge um, piece of information to know that TMS is a possibility and working with insurance is a possibility. One of the other questions that's come up is, has there been any research on identifying gender or age differences in response to TMS? No, we don't know exactly how to tell who's going to get a better response, some response, no response at all. Uh, predictors of recovery is one of those uh, areas where we are really in bad shape. Psychology cannot predict it. And therefore, because we cannot do that, we tell the patients, we have to go through the treatment. Unless we give you a robust trial, I will never know if the treatment works for you. And in general, the reception is quite good, very good. Are there any age limits on in terms of like lowest age or where TMS may not be recommended? Not really. I would say that, uh, that I would uh, strongly recommend patients trying it. Uh, why is that? One is because they have 30% chances of reduction in symptoms. Two, because it's non-invasive. Mm -hmm. Three, because the majority of them have tried multiple treatments, some of them with success, some of their partial success, some no success. Some patients were fortunate, they got better, but then symptoms came back and they are now developing symptoms. So trying some TMS, it makes perfect sense for, for them. Excellent, and the safety and the safety profile, I think is a really big seller in that point of kind of the, the utility of giving it a try um, if it seems warranted. Um, one of the other questions I think relates to that is, what's the time commitment required to do TMS in terms of like the individual sessions, but also kind of the recommended dosage in terms of number of sessions across time? A standard uh, protocol uh, involves at least five weeks of daily sessions. For me, and this means daily sessions from Monday to Friday, five weeks, total of at least 25 sessions in sequence, one after the other. And um, we, we think that uh, there is something in the brain that uh, requires constant repetition in order to achieve maximum recovery. And um, patients may miss treatments and uh, it's expected that happens because people are working, they are sometimes in the hospital, they, there are so many things happening in people's life. But then the more treatment that they can they receive in a week um, from Monday to Friday, the, the higher the chances of success. And it's in some way similar to uh, exposure response prevention in terms of the repeated practice over and over again. Uh, yes. Excellent. Well, uh, there's a question about how much does TMS cost? Uh, should insurance not cover? Um, and then kind of a follow-up to that piece, are there any clinical trials that are currently being done? Uh, Clinical trials that are being done for what purpose or what? Uh, just for TMS for OCD that uh, some, I, I believe it might be in terms of are there opportunities to participate in research if, TIA, if the cost of TMS is prohibitive or um, if insurance won't cover? Yes. Well, the cost it varies from institution to institution and from private offices to private offices. But in general, I would, I would say that it's going to be in the range in the range from probably $8,000 to $12,000 a full course of treatments. Mm -hmm. And um, so trial, that I, I am not aware of any current trial, but I believe that there is always someone doing it, not locally, not in Boston that I'm aware. No, no one is doing a, a, a trial that I'm aware right now. It's possible, it's possible that people are doing uh, some data collection, mm -hmm. but not sham control and, and trial where patients are expected not to pay for this. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so we have a few, a few other questions and then we have about 10 minutes left. So we'll kind of go through a few of these other questions. Um, one of them is, are all types of OCD treatable, such as kind of OCD that revolves around a real life event that happened or maybe kind of generalized out of that event? Um, and are there, is there any information on differences in terms of outcome related to 
the kind of dimension maybe of OCD symptoms or the, or the symptom presentation? I'm not sure I understood well the question, but can you please say it again? Sure, just in terms of the idea of, you know, OCD can take so many different forms. I guess one way to think of, to ask the question would be, is there any variability that you've noticed in treatment outcomes based on the type of OCD symptoms one's experiencing, or does that seem to be a predictor of outcome? Great question. And the answer is no. There is no research that I am aware that has been conducted attempting to compare outcomes, one type of OCD versus the other. However, I have to tell you, Nathaniel, and I would like to share this with all the audience uh, and families, hopefully, and, and, and patients, that we are conducting uh, clinical treatments. Uh, this is not research. We are conducted, but we are gathering data. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you that we uh, work together with uh, McLean Hospital OCD Institute, Institute and all this data is collecting uh, all information necessary to make an analysis of exactly that. And I think we will need Nathaniel and other experts uh, paying attention to those numbers uh, and this, uh, making a proper analysis uh, in order to, to at least have some ideas of how, what is happening, what kind of uh, symptoms seem to respond faster what kind of symptoms are really not responding at all and something in between. That so sounds like it's in the works and a, and a good thing for us to continue to work on uh, to try to get an answer for that. Um, and just to, I'll follow up a little bit on, this sec on the second half of the question around the real event OCD. Um, you know, while I, I can't speak directly to TMS, one of, the, one of the things that we do see just in terms of like treatment in general and ERP for OCD is that even if a real, when a, an event has occurred, if OCD is generalized from it, and there's kind of a fear for the future of something that's based on an act, event that had occurred, treatment still works very well. So it's all about that intolerance of uncertainty um, and kind of intolerance of the uncertainty of the future. And so treatment will still work uh, from a behavioral standpoint. Oscar, would you say that's probably similar from a TMS standpoint? I think so, I, I believe so. And uh, for TMS, the challenge for the near future is how can we make those numbers better? How, uh, what kind of technology will have to be uh, used or adjusted in a way that uh, we would like to see 50, 60, 70% reduction. Uh, we see 70% reduction in symptoms in all patients treated for depression. Wow. And you, you see the difference between depression and OCD where uh, we have a long way to go. But, uh, we, but we just started. And then we hope that the, in the next year, we will have better tools, different tools. That's wonderful. We, if we are discussing this in one year, trust me, it's not something different will be available and hopefully available to patients. Well, it sounds like we'll have to plan to have you back in, back in a year to, to give us an update on how that's going. One of the things actually, you alluded to one of the other questions, one of the kind of final questions was, how does TMS for depression differ from TMS for OCD? And you know, I think just adding a little bit of my own follow-up question on that would be, in the case of comorbidity, if someone has both depression and OCD, where might you start? Yes, at least as you, based on the numbers, at least 50% of patients suffering from OCD will have depression. That is a problem. That is a problem for clinicians, but really the ones that are suffering are the patients. And how can we help them while they suffer both thing, dark, both conditions at the same time? Um, there, are, there, there is published reports showing that when OCD gets better, depression gets better. Especially with one of the coils that we have available. The other aspect of this is that there is already information showing that if we treat depression successfully, mm -hmm. it's going to be a little bit easier to treat OCD. So patients suffering from depression and OCD are really strongly recommended to get treated with one or the other. And hopefully we'll be able to treat them with one single technology targeting both conditions at the same time. 
Excellent. So, then, so maybe also thinking about kind of which one is the most impairing in that moment and using some of those as guide markers. Um, is there a different uh, area of the brain targeted for TMS for OCD versus depression? Absolutely, yes. So for depression, the most common uh, target area is the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that it should be something like here. Uh, in the case of OCD, the areas that are targeted is the cingulate, ante anterior cingulate cortex that is bilateral, is this area plus frontal areas. Mm -hmm. And that is where, where technology makes a big difference. Deep TMS targets the cingulate cortex and frontal areas. The other call that has been already FDA approved targeted only the frontal areas. Uh, we think that it is vital to go deeper and affect the cingulate. And uh, that's why we offer that to patients. And hopefully the more data coming will reinforce the concept that, that uh, Singulate cortex plays a key role, at least for the purposes of TMS in, in OCD treatments. I think that, would, that, that makes sense just in terms of my understanding too of some of the neurosurgery literature around kind of the role of the cingulate and looking at some of the imaging studies. Um, so it's nice to have a non-invasive way, and a safe way to, to target that same, the same pathway um, yes. in other ways uh, without a, the, sur the surgical component. Um, so last two questions and we'll kind of wrap up because we know we're about to um, hit eight o'clock and the OCD goals, goals support group will be coming up after. Um, if someone could put the link uh, just while we're going to the last two, um, if anyone's in the audience that has the link and could put that um, into the chat for everyone, it'd be greatly appreciated. Otherwise I'll do it at the end of today. Um, so kind of some, some last pieces just of, I'll kind of ask real quickly is what do you, what is the treatment success rate for TMS as a whole for OCD specifically? Yes, 30% uh, of all the patients, if we take 100 patients, 30 of them will have from response, which means 50% reduction mm -hmm. for 50% of them, and the rest, different degrees of recovery that it was considered partial response, that it was maybe 20%, 30%, 40%. It doesn't sound like a lot, except that for those people suffering from it yes. and clinicians treating them, uh, reduction matters. Oh, yes. Quality of life becomes central. We are talking about people working, taking care of family, doing things in life, going to school. So reduction of symptoms, even if it is not what we would like it to be, uh, really makes a difference in people's life. Well, and when, when OCD is taking over 24 hours of your day, 50% reduction is a very meaningful, meaningful change. Um, so the last two questions is, has um, ADD or ADHD ever been considered for, for as a TMS treatment target? Yes. And the same, the same concept applies. Uh, there, there, there have been efforts in the case of ADD and HDDHD, and um, there was a time when the stimulation was con uh, because it's believable or considered ADD or ADHD involves hyperactivity of certain areas of the brain. It was considered that using inhibition was the, ch the way to go. Mm -hmm. But science shows us that many times we don't, uh, that we do, our ideas are not right. It was, all testing was negative. Okay. So inhibition didn't work. However, activation for mysterious reasons that we understand a little, but we really don't understand a lot, uh, seem to be helpful. And some patients have shown to experience reduction of symptoms using um, high frequency stimulation. Interesting. Well, so and we'll wrap up with this final question, which I think it kind of brings it all together very nicely in that um, the idea in terms of, you know, kind of ERP and behavioral interventions combined with medications and this idea of kind of promoting like a, an attempt for ERP first and then a combined approach from there versus a medication alone. Um, you know, should ERP and TMS be combined instead of medications? 
or in a certain order? Kind of what would be your recommendations kind of on that front? Nathaniel, thank you very much for asking something that I never said. Uh, because we don't know how to cure OCD and we are not very good with our treatments yet. So we think that the best strategy is combining all effective treatments together simultaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, ERP, definitely medication that uh, the clinicians consider best mm -hmm. and TMS all together probably gives patients better chances. And uh, as many of you might know, also uh, specific ERP programs uh, change outcomes. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation and, and answering so many questions about TMS and its effectiveness. It, it sounds like it's a very exciting time in neurotherapeutics for OCD, and we'll look forward to seeing what updates come with the next year. And sure. may have to have you come back to have another discussion of uh, how things have changed. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I'll be delighted. Um, thank you for joining us. And for those of you in the